fortune. Wait, we, I think we start a little early there, so I'm going to start over. Hi, I'm Rusty Dornan from the Kaufman Fellows Academy, and I'm really excited today to welcome you all to our very first Startup CEO Hangout, featuring Matt Bloomberg, the author and instructor of Startup CEO. But before you get to see Matt in the flesh, I want to congratulate him on Fortune naming Return Path, his company, as the number two mid-sized great place to work in the U.S. Welcome, Matt, and congratulations. Thanks so much, Rusty. I'm happy to be here, and uh, glad we have a bunch of people uh, participating in the course and, uh, and here for the Hangout. Great. Um, I, first of all, I want to start off in saying, why do you think your company was picked up for this honor? I mean, I watch your classes, I watch your lectures, I've been there for the filming, you and I have spoken, and it's obvious you have a a great fundamental philosophy about running a company, but why do you think your company was picked to be the number two great place to work? Well, so the first thing that uh, that people need to uh, understand about any any list you see like that um, is that uh, you do have to apply for those things. Uh, so it's not as if uh, Fortune magazine goes out and uh, looks at every single company in the world and concludes that we are the second best one. Now that said, uh, thousands and thousands of companies do apply for these things, and. Um, Fortune, uh, who partners with uh, the Great Places to Work Institute, um, does um, yeah, they have a, a pretty thorough methodology where they send quantitative surveys to the employee population at random. Uh, they do qualitative phone interviews at random to back it up, uh, and um, they uh, then also get um, a fair number of uh, qualitative written responses with the surveys, and then they obviously compile the data and look at it against everyone else. So, so mathematically, Return Path came out uh, number two out of however many people applied, and um, but none of that answers your question. No, uh, I want to know the real fundamental reasons you think that the way you've kind of set up the company that you're, you know, you get these kinds of of you know nominations. Yeah, I, you know, I think fundamentally people are happy to come work here every day. People are very engaged in what we do. They have a lot of pride in the company, and uh, they feel um, uh, they have a real vested interest in the in the company's success that goes beyond things that are financial. That get get into uh, uh, you know the emotional a little bit. And I think we've done a very, very good job over the years. And if you look at all the comments on the on the uh, uh, Great Places to Work uh, website where they wrote the profile about us, um, we've just taken great care over the years to, um, you know, to make ourselves uh, different from the average workplace. Uh, we put a tremendous amount of trust in our people. Uh, we have a lot of transparency throughout the organization. Those two things go hand in hand. So. You know things like sharing of information, financial information, board of directors materials, sharing that with the whole employee population uh, is the kind of thing that uh, uh, that really gets people engaged and motivated uh, in what they do every day, uh, and uh, you know more likely to be excited to come to work. Um, you know there's a there's a long list of things. It's not sort of hey if you do these three things here's what happens, uh, but I'd say fundamentally it's that people are happy and engaged and have a lot of pride in the company. Um, because uh, because of the way we treat them, and I think it, through the book, and people are going to realize this is the first week of the course that you build that into the foundation of the company. Mm -hmm. Why did you write the book, Startup CEO? What was, what, was, you know, what was your main besides Brad Feld asking you to do it for for his series, Startup Revolution? Right. You now, what was your philosophy about writing it down? Um, you know, the whole thing started out with uh, with a blog that I've been writing now for about ten and a half years. Uh, so it was one of the very early blogs, going back to uh, early two thousand and four. Uh, very one of the very first CEO blogs, and for about ten years, or I guess nine, when I started working on the the book project, um, I had done one or two posts a week about uh, the entrepreneurial journey that I was having. Um, so there were a couple posts about other topics, but for the most part, you know, sort of seventy, eighty percent of the things I had written were about being an entrepreneur, about being a first-time CEO, about being a manager, being a leader, and uh, you know, at, at some point, I had accumulated a lot of that material. And that was when Brad asked me if I would consider, um, as he put it at the beginning, turning my blog into a book. Now, of course, um, what I didn't realize at the time that I enthusiastically agreed to that, because that sounded like a pretty easy proposition, um, 
what I didn't realize at the time was uh, that I had not, in fact, written an entire book's worth of material, <laughs> even though I had been writing it for nine or nine plus years. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of holes to fill in as I made out what I thought was kind of the comprehensive outline that, of, of the book I wanted to write. Um, so I ended up having to, uh, uh, actually having to take a couple weeks off of work and, uh, and make sure that I um, filled in all those holes with, uh, with new chapters. Uh, but, you know, it was very, very uh, uh, happy at the end product. Um, I think, you know, now that it's been out for a while, there are a million things I can think of that I wish I had done differently or could add on to it. But, um, but I've been pretty happy with the end product and I've gotten, have gotten very good feedback on it from lots of entrepreneurs that I know as well. Great. We've got, uh, we've got people watching, of course, submitting questions. And we've sure. got one. Hi, Matt. You say in your book that investors nowadays expect to see a product. If, however, we are talking about a service, what could it mean to show a service? Not sure I understand the question. Um, uh, you know, it, and maybe it may, maybe that I'm just living in the world of technology, where I'm thinking about a technology service, which is actually a product. So I'm going to assume the question is about non-technical services. So, uh, you know, what would you need to do if you wanted to start a a gym or a health spa or something like that? Do you think that's what the question is? You know, I would ask. I'll, I'll ask. I'll throw this out to Mark too. To, we'll, we'll go on, and we'll ask him to maybe get a little uh, more specific in what he's talking about a service, so that you can you can answer that. So, okay. uh, we also had one question on impact investing. Uh, Christina, I just want to let you know that uh, Matt is not real comfortable in answering. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go. We're going to go ahead and move on from that. What are the key things an entrepreneur needs to think about before they dive off? you know, dive out the window, let's say, and go ahead and, and do a startup. What are they, what are the key things they need to have in mind before they do that? Um, you know, I, I think first and foremost, um, you need to understand as an entrepreneur what your level of, of tolerance is for risk. And there are lots of people in the world who are not cut out to be entrepreneurs. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, uh, and you know if you're if you're someone who is extremely risk avoidant, even if being an entrepreneur sounds really glamorous, it may not be the thing for you. If you sort of clear that and and think, okay, you know, I can I can handle it, um, then even within that, you still need to figure out your your appetite for risk. And you know, I think the sort of first decision you need to make is, um, are you going to quit your job? And start the business, or are you going to start it off the side of your desk while you still have income? Um, so that's probably sort of the, the fir first things first. You have to take care of yourself and you know basic needs, and income is one of those things. Um, I think the, the um, you know f f fundamentally uh, you don't want to start a business until you have um, some assurances for yourself and some proof points that um, the business has some likelihood of succeeding. And you know, lot, lots of entrepreneurs, um, I think, fall into the trap of thinking, um, "Hey, I need X, Y, Z product. Therefore, I will start a business around it." Um, and although um, necessity is the mother of invention, and um, it is, uh, you know, one of the ways that people come up with the, the best ideas for starting businesses, um, in and of itself, that is not proof uh, that you should go start a business. And um, the methodology that's kind of outlined in um, Eric Ries and Ash Moria's books, which are The Lean Startup and Running Lean, um, one of which I sort of clip and put in the, uh, one of the early chapters of, of Startup CEO, uh, that methodology is designed to help you systematically test uh, nine different kind of variables of a business model um, before you uh, jump in and commit all your time and resources to it. And um, there's some real rigor to that methodology that you have to follow, uh, but it's not hard. Uh, and you know, at the end of it, you may still produce something that fails as a business or even fails as a, as a product or a service. Um, but that's probably the easiest way to think about kind of mitigating risk and maximizing chance of success up front. Okay, uh, we have uh, Mark came back to us. Uh, Mark Antoine came back to us saying that you know in your book, investors expect to see a product, but we're talking about a service. He says, "What about a service where you connect investors with farms?" 
So, you know, I think, so that's a product. Um, and, um, you know, to sort of come back to the last couple statements I made, but, but kind of reframe them in light of that question, um, you, there are several hypotheses about that service that you can systematically test. Um, you know, most specifically with that one, uh, connecting investors with farms. Um, you know, our, is that, that was it, right? So, uh, so are farmers interested in that service and what, what is their level of need and what will they pay for it or how will they engage with it? Um, are investors interested in that service and how important would it be to them and how would they engage with it? Uh, how much would it cost you to get going? What does the competitive landscape look like? There's you know, this whole series of questions that um, you can answer without putting a lot of money into it. Um, you know, putting a little bit, a little bit of research money, but without uh, sort of constructing the whole thing uh, to um, understand the chance of success. Okay, I have another question. Uh, I've seen from your courses and audience that there are people from several industries. On the other hand, a startup, according to Paul Graham, Eric Ries, and other author, authors' definition, should be a highly scalable business. What is a startup for you? Um, I understand what those I understand what those guys are saying, and and they're look they come from the world of of technology and software. I. I disagree with that. I think if you're starting a business, it's a startup. And startups can come in lots of flavors. Scalable is one of them. Technology is one of them. Uh, but you know, I have friends and relatives who have started uh, wine stores, uh, who have started um, you know, farm-to-table food businesses. And I consider them startup CEOs as much as I consider um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg having started a startup. Uh, next one is, uh, hi Matt, I took the leap. We launched beta in August on a small angel round. Now we need to grow a good advisory board, although most of the really great people who can help us have conflicting investments. How do you find people outside our current circle? So, I think, um, uh, People with conflicting investments is something you need to dig in on first. So I would challenge your assumption a little bit. And one of my board members, longtime investors, good, good friends, has a has a great saying, which is, um, "No conflict, no interest." <laughs> and um, it may well be that someone that you think is conflicted, um, in fact, is not really conflicted. There's an appearance of a conflict, but um, it's something that you can work through. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't rule out anyone that you think is conflicted. You know, someone who has a $25,000 angel investment in XYZ company, um, you know, might be, might be willing to advise you, you know, as long as you're not devoted in your entire life to killing that company, you're in adjacent spaces or part of the, the same value chain. So I would challenge that assumption, first of all. But I think on the, um, your broader questions, so let's assume you've done that already, and, and in fact, um, you know, there's no one that's uh, uh, that's sort of surfacing um, uh, due to due to conflicting investments. Um, think about the skills and competencies and content and experience uh, that you're missing that you need around the table. And if you sort of disaggregate those things, um, you can find some very good advisors who have financial experience. If you're missing financial experience, and it doesn't matter what industry that's from or um, you know, sales and marketing experience in a, in a nearby industry, but nothing that's conflicting. Uh, so you know, I, I would say sort of break apart your need into its bits and chase the bits instead of chasing the whole. OK. Uh, next question. How important is it for a CEO startup to think about from the beginning about basic operating stuff like selecting tools, internal administrative processes, etc. How important is it to enforce such processes from the beginning? Does it pay off? Um, my view is is really uh, really clear on this one, which is it's worth it and it's worth doing it from the beginning, and it pays off. And um, you know, I would say that's true for for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, one is uh, you know there is a there is a penalty you pay even at small scale for lack of coordination. 
and um, uh, you know, you, and you you may feel like, hey, we're going to be the kind of startup that's grassroots and bottom up, and we're not going to have policies, and that's fine. You can be light on all of that stuff, but um, you know, if you wake up one day and I don't know, let's pick an example. A third of your company is using Dropbox, a third of it's using Box, and a third of it's using Google Drive. Um, you're going to have problems. Mm -hmm. So I th you know, there are some basic things that. Um, you know, you can try to make sure that everyone is sort of standardized on. It's just so you can communicate and share information and collaborate with each other. Um, I think on, on, you know, sort of a broader question, though, which is um, I would frame that question as how much time should I spend building my company as opposed to how much time should I spend building my business? Um, and that... Uh, uh, that I think is a very, very central question for entrepreneurs, and I think most most entrepreneurs tend to be very focused on product and business, right? They have a product idea, and they want to drive that through to completion, and that drive is essential, right? You absolutely have to do that, because obviously if there's no product at the end of the day, you can't build a company around it. Um, but I think a lot of entrepreneurs ignore company building um, at their own peril. And they sort of say, yeah, that's the stuff that's not important. I'll put that off for another day. And that's stuff like um, not just sort of standardizing systems and processes, but, um, but answering questions like, what are the company's values? Um, what's the company's mission? Um, how do we want to behave? Uh, do we want to have offices, or do we want everyone working remotely? Um, you know, some, some really um, kind of fundamental questions um, about how the company is going to behave and how it's going to hold individuals accountable for getting their job done. And I think it's never too early to do that. I think the minute you have two people in an organization, you have to start doing that. And when I think about, um, you know, the, the top five reasons or the top ten reasons why Return Path is still here 15 years later as an independent uh, company that is, you know, now scaled and still thriving and growing, um, I would say one of the top few reasons is that in the early days, we spent as much time building the business as we did building the company, even when it seemed silly. And I, you know, I think the reason, that there are probably two, two things that that led to um, uh, where, where that's the, the real root cause of the success. One is, I would say we had three times in our life where our business wasn't working well, where, you know, our first product kind of failed, or at least went sideways, uh, where uh, you know we had significant operational problems, things like that. And you know you hear all the time about people who pivot their business. So we've pivoted a couple times. Uh, you hear about people reinventing their business. Um, it is much easier to pivot and to reinvent your business when there's a solid company underneath it. Um, otherwise, if your product fails and your business fails, um, sometimes there's kind of no reason to bother reinventing. Um, so I think that's one real benefit that comes from, um, from having a solid company and investing the time in company building and not just product building or business building. Um, I think the other thing is that it does set the stage for scaling down the road. Uh, so if you have coherent values, for example, um, when you move from 10 employees to 20 to 50 to 100, um, those values come with you, and they help you make sure that you're hiring the right people and you're managing people the right way and in a consistent way and in a way that you're happy with as the CEO. Um, if you don't have that foundation, things can get all over the place on you. Yeah, and speaking of reinventing themselves, we are going to be, people should be thinking about it because we are going to be asking people to do that in the class. Um, next question. If you have a good validation of your product in the market but don't have enough money to get started, borrowing money for $40,000 is a good idea to test the water? Um, you would certainly not be the first entrepreneur to take on personal debt and max out credit cards. Uh, and a lot of great ones have done that over the years. Uh, and, uh, you know, this sort of comes back to the very first question, Rusty, that you asked, which is around, um, you know, or my answer was around understanding your, your tolerance for risk. Should you quit your job or not? Uh, and, um, you know, what I would say is um, to figure out the minimum amount of money you can spend to run down the nine box framework to test the hypotheses. Uh, in your idea for starting a business. And if that costs you $40,000, then it costs you $40,000 and you 
you can then make the decision about whether you want to invest that in the prospect uh, of having a business on the other end or having killed off an idea. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me see. We've got two more. For, uh, well, how important is location to securing seed stage institutional capital? I'm in Atlanta and I'm prepared to move to Southern California or Bay Area. Should I express my willingness upfront or wait for prospective investor to ask? That's mm -hmm. an interesting question. I think it's probably less and less important over time. It's probably not unimportant. Um, yeah, there are plenty of great startups that have popped up in all corners of the country, in all corners of the globe, not just in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a certain amount of density, though, in places like Silicon Valley or New York, or even uh, you know, sort of some of the next next cities down, like Boulder, or Colorado, or Seattle, or Boston. Um, Atlanta is probably one of them, quite frankly. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't jump on a plane and pack all your stuff up. Nor would I volunteer that in the first phone call with an investor. I, I will say, you know, it's interesting in Silicon Valley. I mean, there's still there is still a bias that some people don't like to invest outside the valley. I mean, that is, and and to understand when you're going to that investor, I do you think, Matt, that people should do their research if it looks like this investor doesn't really invest outside of their geographic location, then the chances are they're probably not going to be. But plenty of people do, but there are yeah, there are some people who don't. Yeah, I, I you know I think another way. Um, Another way to, to potentially deal with that is you know, programs like Techstars or Y Combinator have you in residence somewhere for a period of time um, and then focus on sort of delivering you to uh, the relevant early stage investors in that community. Um, so that's a way potentially of having the best of both worlds. You don't actually have to move, uh, but you uh, might end up deciding you want to move because you've spent some time somewhere and gotten integrated with that community and, and met the investors there, and you can always ask those investors. Uh, I think you know one thing, Rusty, that probably makes a lot of sense, which, which you just sort of prompted for me, is ask. It doesn't hurt to ask. Uh, there's a big difference between between being defensive or, or proactive, I guess, and saying, "Hey, you know, I'll move to the valley. Don't don't mind me," um, and uh, and just asking an investor, you know, how, how critical is it that uh, yeah that your early stage investments are are down the street from you? Uh, did you ever face any kind of fundamental disagreement with your partners or co-founders, especially with regards to value? How do you handle such disagreements, being the CEO, and how should you handle them if you aren't the CEO but a minor partner? Um, it feels like there were about eight questions in there. You know. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I ever had very significant disagreements with some of my early employees or early, early co-founders um, about things like values. I think... Um, uh, you know, I, I had a structure from the beginning where um, where I was the CEO, and I had some very early people who joined, who now 15 years later I kind of refer to them as co-founders. But at the time, I was still kind of the only founder, so I'm not sure I quite have the relevant experience for that. I would say, um, you know, at the end of the day, companies need a leader. They need a CEO. That CEO needs to be make, making decisions, comfortable making decisions. Um, at the same time, I think if you're a founding team and you can't agree um, as a founding team in the early days of a business on some fundamental truths about your business, like how will we behave, um, you know, is transparency important to us or not, if you can't agree on these, those things up front, then um, better to find that out up front. So if you're not the CEO founder, you have to voice your feelings. Uh, and voice your point of view. If you are the CEO founder, you have to be able to listen to that. You also have to be able to make a decision about it. And at the end of the day, look, being I think being partners in a, in a business or true co-founders in a business, even if someone's the CEO and someone's the CTO or, or something reporting into the CEO, um, it's, you know, it's a marriage and you've got to work at it. And um, if you find out early on that it's not going to be a happy marriage, better to, uh, better to know that up front and, you know, 
figure out some way of, of unwinding it so that you don't end up killing the business down the road um, by kind of openly disagreeing uh, on fundamentals. Another question about just relationships among the management team. Um, I have recently been appointed as the CEO of a company I have been a part of since the beginning. It can be difficult navigating legacy issues within the company, especially when the former CEO is currently the president of the company. Any advice? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, first, first of all, congratulations yeah. on your appointment as CEO. That's great news. Uh, I don't know that there's off-the-shelf advice, and I'd have to ask you a million follow-up questions, which you're probably not not going to have at the moment. It, you know, if that's a dialogue you want to have with me, you can email me or or connect with me through through Rusty or through the course. Um, you know, I think though, at the end of the day, if you if you accepted the appointment as CEO and that was made to you by presumably a, a board of directors of some kind. Um, you know, you're the you're the person that's in charge, and with that comes two things. One is the authority to make tough decisions, and that could include um, moving the former CEO, now president, out of the business. Um, but it also comes with the responsibility to do everything um, in your power to motivate people, uh, to build consensus when you need to, uh, and to not you know sort of leave a hole in the ground. Um, so, like I said, there's there. The too many specifics that are, are hard to generalize with that, but um, it is a situation that I've seen or seen things similar to. Um, they're difficult, but they're not impossible. All right. Uh, last question here, just because of our time. Uh, Matt, another question I found interesting in the book that you explained that the ideas that gave birth to Return Path were not yours. The question I have is, how did James Marciano convince you, the potential CEO, to jump with him based on his idea? Um, it wasn't him. I loved the idea, uh, and I mean, I guess the part of part that was him that convinced me to do it was he said, uh, "I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to be involved in it, and I'd love to advise it a little bit, maybe be on the board for the first year or two." Um, and I, I think it's those two things. I think if I had loved the idea and he said. You know, but I'm going to be the executive chairman, and my office is going to be right next to yours, and I'm going to help you make every decision. It wouldn't have been for me because I really wanted to be the founder and the entrepreneur. Um, but he didn't sell me on the idea. The idea spoke to me. Okay. I'm going to ask you. I just want to ask you one other question because this first week is about storytelling. You know, it's key for successful founders. But you know, what if you just aren't really that great at it? How can you develop that talent? What should you do if you're just not the, the best? You know, you have passion around your company. You're just not really good at telling the story. Practice. <laughs> uh, practice, practice, practice. And the good thing about being a CEO uh, is you have to tell your story over and over and over and over. Uh, so you'll get that practice. And whether you're doing it with your spouse or your friends or in front of a mirror or your grandmother or your dog, and I tell people frequently, dogs and cats are great, great uh, <laughs> practice partners. Uh, you just got to keep doing it. And if you have the passion, um, you will get good enough at articulating the story. You have time for one more? Sure. As CEO, how much time do you spend working on the business versus in the business? What do you reserve for yourself? Um, it's hard to make time to work on the business, and I would say there, uh, it is not the same every week um, and every month. It definitely ebbs and flows. Um, I do track my time pretty carefully. Uh, I track it after the fact. So like once a quarter, my assistant and I download my calendar, and we carve it up into a few buckets and look at it and uh, try to figure out generally how we want to steer my time for the upcoming quarter. Um, I think what I shoot to have is about uh, 30, 25 to 30 percent of my time unscheduled, noting that a bunch of it will get sucked up uh, into things that are in the business and not on the business. Um, but some of it will end up getting used by me to be uh, working on the business. And you know, if I'm going through a stretch where my schedule is very crowded, and this happens to be one of those stretches right now, um, I'll make sure that we block out, you know, two hours three times a week 
so that I have some time and space to think. Uh, and just, you know, put that time on the calendar and no one can invade it. What I love is your description on Twitter where you, you, know, you talk about you're the CEO of this company and then you say, but mostly I'm a little tired. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we do have a couple other questions, but I'm going to ask people to go ahead. Uh, hopefully, you're st a student, and so you can go ahead and ask Matt directly. And if you're not a student, please, please, there is still time to sign up for Startup CEO um, on NovoEd, Startup CEO-2. Uh, also, if you want any more information on it, just uh, go ahead and follow us, uh, KF Academy, on Twitter. So once again, congratulations on your nomination or your awarding of the number two mid-sized company, great place to work. Easy to understand why. I can see you'd be a great boss. I've already asked you for a job. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Rusty. Nice talking to everyone. All right. We'll see you again in a couple weeks. Okay. Great. Thanks, bye. Bye.